Hi there, I'm Professor Juris and I'm going to make you a quick video on how to code a cyanotype print. So our first video that we went over was how to mix the chemistry. So in this video what we're going to do is actually show you how to code the print. So um, I'm going to be using an 8x10 negative um, for this print and here's, a, here's an actual cyanotype that I made from an 8x10 negative and I just wanted to show you what we're making. It's a basically a blueprint on paper. So let me talk just a bit, little bit about the paper before we get started. So the paper that I'm going to be using to make this print on is um, the Hannah Meal Photo Rag paper, or platinum paper that's made specifically for making platinum prints. But I'm going to try making a cyanotype on it. I've already made them on it. I know they come out good, but I wanted to show you another paper too. Um, because you're just starting out and the cyanotype process is fairly cheap, uh, it might be better for you to try it on a cheaper paper than before you go to the um, Hannah Mill Platinum Rag. So we have this paper available at the bookstore and it's um, Crane's Crest paper. It's actually a fine 100% cotton acid free um, stationary paper. And I'm gonna, I brought my little headlamp here so I could turn this light on and by doing this, I can shine the light through the paper, and hopefully you'll be able to see the, um, the watermark that's in the paper right there. Uh, the words Crane's, Crane's Crest is in there. And when you can read it, when you can read the watermark on the paper, um, that is the side that you code on. So you could go through and just put a little X on each one if you want to on the side that you do it. But it's important to understand the watermark um, like this print right here is printed on um, Reeves BFK paper, and I don't think I see the watermark on it, but it was a full sheet. It was like a 32 by, or 22 by 30 inch sheet of paper that I tore down into these um, 11 by 14 pieces of paper. And when I did that, if you tear up a sheet like that, what you wanna do is, um, there's only, the watermark is only in one place on the piece of paper. And again, that is the side that you code on. So when I'm looking at this, if I'm like looking at this through the, and letting light go through the piece of paper, um, and I can read the words Crane's Crest, that means that's the side that you code on. Now, if the writing's backwards when you're reading through it, then it's the wrong side. You wanna always coat when you're coding fine art papers on the side that, where you can read the watermark correctly or it's correctly oriented. Um, so if you buy a big sheet of paper and you tear it down, the watermark's only going to be on one of those pieces. So that's why these little X's are a good indication of that's the side that you print on. So once you've torn it up, you'll know what side to print on. Now some of the other papers that already comes um, cut to size and so forth, it'll tell you in the package that the emulsion side is up or the emulsion side is down. Um, there's a little um, thing in there and this one is emulsion side. I have it up so I can just pull them out and coat them. So to get started, what I'm going to need to do is I'll have, I have my negative there ready to go and I have my sheet of paper. And what I've done is I've taken a pencil and I've traced the negative. I'm not sure if you can see that or not. It's kind of bright in here maybe. Um, now I am going to coat this under a normal tungsten light bulb. And you can do that in your home like under a regular house lamp. The only thing you want to make sure of is that you're not coating it under a high ultraviolet light source. Like if you have a, um, a bunch of fluorescent lights in the room and they're on, uh, that could actually end up fogging the paper after a little bit of time. Now we normally do this um, in school in the, in the dark room in the lab area where there's a lot of fluorescent lights. And I always tell the students that you have to work quickly. You can't um, you know, dilly dally and let the paper sit around to dry under the lights because it will get fogged. So you want, to, um, you want to do this as fairly quickly as possible, but under a, a tungsten light bulb, you have a little bit more time when you're, um, when you're doing this. So what I'm gonna do right now is take, um, I've labeled the bottles A and B, and I labeled the caps too to make sure I put the cap right on the, on the right bottle. And the reason I do that is if you have some of the B solution and you're putting it on the A bottle, you could actually eventually over time contaminate the, the solution that's in there. And you can use um, droppers to, to do this, but you need to, again, even label your, your droppers so that you get the right, amount, right um, dropper in each bottle. And these are the droppers that'll come with the kit, and I think they're always a little bit short. You can only go down so much, and you're going to end up like 
having to turn the bottle on its side and stuff to get the solution out. But some you can get these at a pharmacy, these little bit longer ones. And this one's actually made of glass. I like the glass better than the plastic. I think that it, um, it cleans out really well. But what I'm going to do for this is, because I'm going to be making several prints tonight, is I'm going to make my solution. Now, the solution only becomes light sensitive once it's dried. Um, and it'll last for a little while. And what I mean by a little while is a couple hours. You, you don't want to mix both bottles together when you first get it so you don't have to do this. But you always want to mix it right before you use it and then use it within like a couple hours. But Because um, it will start to fog a little bit and, you know, get messed up if you just leave it under the light. But it really turns light sensitive once it's dry. Now, I am doing this right on my dining room table, and there's a window, you know, right out here to my left, but it is nighttime now. It's um, about 10 o'clock at night, so it's totally dark out, so I'm not getting any sunlight in. Now, you, wherever you decide to coat this at, you have to coat it in a room, again, where there's no ultraviolet light, so there's no sunlight coming through the window or so forth. So if you have a darkened bathroom or a darkened bedroom, um, where you have like blackout curtains and stuff, someplace like that down in your basement. Um, when I had my dark room um, at another home, I, I had the windows, a lot of windows in the basement. And what I did was I actually went to the automotive store and got some spray on black undercoating and just sprayed all the windows um, in the basement there. And then I could print all day during the day when there's sun outside because the, the windows were totally blacked out. And I think if I remember correctly, I sprayed them with that undercoating on both sides. But um, once you do that, it's, um, you know, you're pretty much done. So you, with the windows, so you have to make sure that um, you're never gonna go back. Otherwise you're gonna be scraping it with a razor blade probably. But another thing I do here is I'm not coating this right on my dining room table. I have a piece of gator board here that I'm gonna put the paper down on top of in case I go a little bit over or spill a little bit. I could have actually even got a little bit bigger piece, I think, but I'm gonna to try to be a little bit careful um, not to you know, go over onto my table. But I, when I'm done, I do really wanna clean up everything and make sure everything's cleaned up. So what I'm gonna do is mix this by the cap full because I'm going to coat a few prints tonight. So I'm gonna look at a line in there and then coat, fill each one up to that line. So. Um, so here's part A right here, and it doesn't matter when you're pouring this in there if you pour part B in first or part A. The, the idea is that you're um, just mixing half and half or, you know, equal amounts of each one. So I have the A done, and I'm going to put it over there. Notice I put the cap back on. Always put the cap back on because for some reason you're, you turn around fast or something and you hit this bottle, and you're going to end up spilling all your chemistry all over. And... It's not so bad with cyanotype, but if you do it with um, your palladium mixture or your platinum mixture, you um, end up costing yourself a lot of money. So, so I'm going to put part B in now, and I just carefully fill it to the same line. I'm using the thread mark in the cap as my line and put it in there. So now I have that mixed. And what I'm going to do is, again, I put the lid back on that. I'll set that down there. And now I just swirl this around a little bit. Now I'm using a brand new Hake brush here. And um, you can get these at the art supply store. If Actually, if you just Google online, maybe you're on Amazon or something, um, or just go I would actually just Google it in Google because you can find other art supply stores that sell these. But this is called the Japanese Hake brush. And the important thing about the brush that you use for these processes is that they don't have any metal in them. So this is this hair is sewn in. Another brush you can use is a foam brush, and I'll get one for another video to show you, but the little black foam brushes that you get like at Lowe's or Home Depot. Now, they sell them at different stores, but the ones you get usually have a round wooden handle, um, and the, the foam is a very thick foam. In other words, you can't really see through it. I've seen these at the dollar store with like red plastic handles, but those don't coat very good because uh, you can almost see through the foam that's on the, the thing, and it's a very coarse foam. It almost looks like a, a Brillo pad or something, but the, the foam, the sponge foam that's on the, the ones that have a round wooden handle is, um, is, is fine to work with. So I'm ready to coat this now. And again, my... my um, size of the paper, my watermark size is up, and I have my solution here. So I'm just going to take this brush, and I'm going to dip this in here for a second. Now the key with um, coating cyanotype is you don't want to just pour this on and get a real heavy mixture. Cyanotype works a lot better if it's a, a nice 
you have to coat, you know, get enough emulsion down there to coat it, but you don't want puddles of it. You want it to be nice and smooth and just a nice thin emulsion. So I'm going to start at one side here and just go across like this. Um, and once I've done that, I'll come back up here maybe and stretch it down a little bit. And then I'm going to go this direction. And you can see just from loading the brush one time, I have enough solution here to cover this 8x10. And I just want to go back and forth several times until I um, have the emulsion soaked into the paper really nicely. Now, when you're doing the Crane's Crest paper, if you're doing the, the paper, and again, they have this at the bookstore for like a quarter of a sheet, and you can order it online. You can actually order it directly from Crane's. They're in Connecticut. Um, you can buy like a 500 sheet pack of this from Crane's. They sell it by a ream, I think it you know, is, or a half ream, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but um, you get a lot of it in there, or you can just buy it for a quarter of a sheet at the bookstore. I think that's what it used to be. And, Hopefully it's still the same, but so I'm going to go ahead and coat this again now. And you can see how um, nice and smooth this emulsion is coming out. And the nice thing about the um, the Hake brushes versus a foam brush is the Hake brush actually gives you these these nice edges in here. And I used to when I used to map my work and you know frame it for shows, and that's the way this print was. I would show this whole thing, so I would my mat would come up to the you know the edge right here and leave a little bit of this around, so people could actually see the brush marks, um, because that's part of the process. The way I do a lot of prints now, though, is I actually come in really clean, but I coat the you know I coat the whole thing out beyond the lines so that. Um, I can put a mat over it and it'll be really smooth and clean looking. But either way is acceptable when you're, when you're doing this. So right now I'm ready to dry this and what I have next is my hair dryer over here. And you want to dry it with cool air. So I turn my hair dryer, I'm going to go to the high position and then I'm going to hit the cool air. Now, you can see how particular I was with drying it. I want to make sure this is really dry. And again, when you're doing it, I would recommend wearing safety goggles, um, you know, a lab coat, an apron, and, and rubber gloves, and so forth. But I'm just, for this video, I'm not wearing gloves because I wanted to touch this and make sure it's, it's dry in the video, um, or dry when I make my prints. So once this is, is in this position, then the next thing, it's ready for the negative. Now, let's say that in your family, um, maybe your grandparents or something have some large negatives from some old cameras and you want to print those. Or let's, I used to actually work for the, um, or I did some work for the um, uh, Mahoning Valley Historical Society and we were printing some of their negatives. And when we did that, because these were like early negatives, like, you know, 100 year old negatives. And when we did that in glass plates and we didn't want the, the negative to actually touch the emulsion. And you may not want your negative to touch the emulsion either. So when you, when another thing you could do is actually go to the art supply store and get a roll of very thin mylar. And then you could put actually put a piece of very thin mylar down over top of this emulsion before you put your negative down on it. And by doing that, by putting a piece of mylar down before you put your negative down, it's not going to get the chemicals in contact with your negative in case it's not dry. But again, I'm just, you know, looking this over and I'm, I'm making sure that this is totally dry before I um, put my negative on there because otherwise 
the negative is going to stick to the emulsion and you're going to ruin your negative. And you could try washing it a lot and stuff, but this chemical will react with the negative and put a stain on it. So um, then you're going to be stuck with it, a ruined negative. So I will get my, my negative now, okay? And when I'm printing a, a large format negative, like an 8x10 negative, if you look over the um, instructions on, for example, loading a film holder for a 4x5 camera, 8x10 camera, it'll tell you that when you're holding the negative, there's a notch in the negative, and I'm not sure if you can see this in this particular film, but there's a little notch up here that's cut into it, that tells you what kind of film it is. But when you're holding that, if I'm holding it in my right hand, and the notch is again like that, then it means the emulsion is facing you. So these are contact printing processes, just like you'd make a contact print. Um, so you want the emulsion to always go down. So I'm gonna take this now, and I know the emulsion's right there. This is the emulsion side. So I'm gonna set this down on here. Now, if I was using like a homemade um, type of contact printing frame, I would put a piece of very heavy glass on top of this. Um, like you want it to be like a quarter of an inch thick. You don't want it to be any thicker than that. And you could go to a glass supply store and actually get that if you um, don't have your contact printing frame yet or you want to make a few prints without one someplace. You can just put a piece of quarter inch glass on top of this and carry this whole thing outside if you're going to be printing outside. Now, I'm going to have another video that goes over the light sources that you can use for, for doing this. And since you're doing this at night, if you're doing this like during class time, during studio time, you'll need to come up with some type of light source. And again, you want to have an ultraviolet, a high ultraviolet light source. I have an exposure box that I actually use to expose mine. But um, we're going to actually expose a couple um, when I go over lighting things out in the sun, too, so you can do that. Now, I have actually um, taught workshops down at Daytona Beach Community um, College at Boardman High School um, up in Youngstown, where we went in and um, actually taught a workshop on cyanotypes to the students and, and did this with the sun because they didn't have no light source there. So we simply took the prints out in the sun and exposed them, and it, you know, it works great. You have to be a little bit more precise with your timing, but um, and hopefully the sun's not like changing with clouds and stuff, and that's the thing that you got to work with. But so I'm ready to go in my frame now. I'm using a Bostwick and Sullivan um, contact printing frame that um, was made by Elm Industries in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. So what I'm going to do with this is I've already opened the back up, and I believe maybe I don't have some canned air here. I think I already blew it off and my canned air is over there, but I already blew this off, but you might want to get some canned air every time that you do this. And I did just wipe this down with Windex. You can see that the glass is really clean. I cleaned this all before I got started. So what I'm going to do now is, um, again, line my negative up with my, my pencil lines on there, and I'm going to hold it by both corners and come over here, and I will simply set this down in there and put it in like that and then I put my finger on there to make sure that the negative goes down. And this is 11 by 14 paper and it fits perfectly um, into the 11 by 14 contact printing frame. So now I'm going to put the back on the contact printing frame and again it bends and I'll show you why it bends in a minute and why these are really slick. And what I'm going to do now is push this down on both sides and slide these into, um, into the slots that are in there so it locks. And Again, I will do it on that, that side, but one of the nice things about this contact printing frame is, is as you're printing, if you're like learning how to look at the print, because it is somewhat of a printing out process. In other words, you will get some somewhat of an image there when you're printing. So you can actually open one side of the back up and drop this back, and then you can reach in and get your piece of paper if you have fingernails, I keep mine very clean, but, um, and pull this back and you could actually see if you got any image there yet after like so many minutes in the sun or something. And what happens is because this is so tight that your negative stays in registration, when I drop that back down, the negative is gonna line up in the exact same place. And you can't do that unless you have one of these split back contact printing frames. If you have one that just the whole thing comes out, you can't really open it up and look at it. And that's a, a very nice benefit. So. You know, I'm going to close this up now, and you know one other thing I, I wanted to mention if you're if you're shooting um, large format film is this is um, a piece of Triax film, and Triax is a really good film to use, and I, that's the film I would recommend. 
um, and there's some Ilford films that are good too, but the films you do not want to use, um, I think I think there's the T-Max 100 for sure, and I'm not sure about the T-Max 400, but with the T-Max film, they have a coating on them that actually blocks ultraviolet light. So if you put a T-Max 100 negative in here, for example, you could leave it out in the sun for three days and it wouldn't expose the paper. It's, the light's not gonna go through at that ultraviolet light source until you burn it out of the negative. Once you burn that you know, ultraviolet blocker out of the negative, then you'd be able to print the paper. But um, so tr when you're doing this, if you're gonna start shooting like pinhole camera or you got an eight by 10 camera or four by five camera, I would recommend just starting with Tri-X film and uh, sticking with it. And my preference for developing large format film is HC 110. So anyway, I hope this helps and uh, the next video will be on uh, developing this. So if you like this video, give me a thumbs up and smash that subscribe button. Thank you.